Well, good evening, everybody, and, and, and welcome. It's great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, in all lectures are, are a special occasion in, in any university, and, and one of the great pleasures of being a part of a university is the opportunity to come and listen to inaugural lectures um, in which some of our, our very best researchers present really their lifetime's work. Um, and I always find I learn um, so much in them. Um, tonight, I'm delighted to be introducing Michael Freno, um, clinical professor and head of UEA's Norwich Medical School. Michael is fairly new to UEA, having joined the university in January of this year. He began his distinguished career at Westminster Medical School, where he qualified in 1980. In the same year, Michael was the University of London gold medalist. After senior house officer posts at Hammersmith and Brompton Hospitals and the National Hospital for Neurology and Neuroscience in Queen Square, he trained in clinical cardiology, undertaking research in Edinburgh, Hammersmith, and at St George's Hospitals in London and Christchurch, New Zealand. After being appointed the clinical senior lecturer and clinical director of cardiology at the Royal Brisbane Hospital in Australia in 1991, Michael was promoted to professor. In 1995, he also took on the role of deputy director of medicine for Brisbane Hospital. On returning from Australia, Michael took up the British Heart Foundation's Sir Thomas Lewis Chair of Cardiology in Cardiff and the Foundation's Chair of Cardiology in Birmingham. In 2009, he was appointed to the Regius Chair of Medicine in Aberdeen, established in 1497. This is the oldest chair of medicine in the English-speaking world. Alongside his current position as head of Norwich Medical School, Michael is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and a member of grant panels for the Academy, for the Medical Research Council and for the British Heart Foundation. Michael's own clinical interests focus on heart muscle diseases and heart failure. Given this organ's crucial role, it's not surprising that disorders of the heart muscle may result in severe symptoms, perhaps even in cardiac death. Throughout the next hour, Michael will describe how careful investigation of the disturbed physiology uh, in these disorders can lead to the development of effective therapies. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our visitors uh, to the University of East Anglia this evening and now ask Pi Professor Michael Freno to present his inaugural lecture. Michael. Thank you, Professor Peckley, for the uh, introduction, uh, and uh, welcome, uh, Professor Peckley, Professor Harvey, colleagues, and visitors. Um, I'm going to, in the next hour, um, describe some of the research that I've done over my career. And in summary, I'm an integrated physiologist, so I'm interested in how whole systems function and how they interact with each other. And that work has spanned a range of disease states. Um, uh, but has focused on cardiac physiology, vascular physiology, and the interaction of the two. But first and foremost, I'm a clinician. Uh, I'm a clinical cardiologist. And the term is often used in translational research that it's bench to bedside. <laughs> and as a clinician, my approach has been a little different. I start with the patient, the patient in front of me, uh, and their problems, and often the outlier who doesn't fit the, the, the standard textbook description, is what gives me the inspiration to actually undertake a, 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 a research on underlying path pathophysiology. Having understood the pathophysiology, then I attempt to take this forward in terms of understanding diagnosis, risk factor stratification, or developing novel therapies, and finally take that back to the patient. So essentially, it's patient to bench to patient research. And this evening, I'm going to give you three themes of the research that have taken place across my career to try to give some insights into that process. So the first thing to say is that the heart is a truly exceptional relentless pump. During an average lifetime, it beats approximately three billion times. And with each of those beats, the pressure that it generates would be sufficient to squirt blood 30 feet across a room. And yet it's the size of the palm of the hand. During that lifetime, it pumps approximately 220 million litres of blood. And unlike our car engine, it isn't serviced every 12,000 miles. 
So I want to ask a question. What do all of these people have in common? Any, any answers? Okay. They, they, they have a heart, <laughs> but actually these people all died suddenly of a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at a relatively young age. And this evening I'm going to be talking about heart muscle diseases, in particular two types. So what are cardiomyopathies? So these are disorders of heart muscle in which the heart muscle is structurally and functionally abnormal. And that occurs in the absence of some of the more common diseases which can also afflict the heart, such as disease of the coronary arteries, high blood pressure, diseases of heart valves or congenital heart disease. And it's divided into five groups. Um, the first of which is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the second dilated, the third is restrictive, the fourth is a, a condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and then an unclassified group including a, a disorder which we used to think was very rare, we now actually appreciate with improved imaging, is actually quite common, called left ventricular non-compaction. But I'm going to be focusing this evening on these first two, hypertrophic and dilated. So what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, which is the cause of death of those individuals who you saw on an earlier slide? This is a disease in which the heart muscle is abnormally thickened. So on the left, you can see a schematic of a normal heart with the four chambers, left ventricle, atrium, right atrium, right ventricle. And uh, the, the walls of the heart are typically about 10 millimeters. But the characteristic feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that the walls are very thickened, sometimes up to 30 or even 40 millimetres thick. And often, but not always, this particularly affects the septum, which divides the two ventricles. And if you look up the, under the microscope at the histology, on the left is a, a healthy individual, until they died, um, but an otherwise healthy individual. And you can see that the myocytes, the myocytes are relatively uniform in size, in shape, in alignment, and in structure. All of them are pretty similar, with small amounts of fibrous tissue between them. But the characteristic feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is complete disorganization of this architecture. You can see that the myocytes vary hugely in their size, in their shape, in their orientation. And there's also quite extensive collagen tissue. And this phenomenon is called myocyte disarray. And in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly those who die suddenly, this is extensive throughout the heart. So what does, what does this look like in functional terms? So on the left is a cardiac MR scan of a healthy subject. And you can see the four chambers of the heart, the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right atrium, the right ventricle. And in black is the muscle, the left ventricular muscle, and the white is the cavity containing blood. And you can see that the heart contracts relatively vigorously and in a synchronous fashion. And as it does so, it empties the chamber, expelling the contents into the aorta. So this is a normal MRI scan of a heart. On the right is a, an MRI of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think you can see immediately that if you look at the thickness of the heart muscle, it's markedly increased. And actually, in this particular disorder, the problem is not one of contraction. Actually, typically, the heart contracts in a supranormal fashion. And you can see that actually so, so forcefully that the cavity is completely eliminated, actually causing an obstruction to outflow in many cases. The problem actually is that the heart is stiff and it doesn't fill properly. So this is the underlying pathophysiology of the disorder. And although there were descriptions of this disease dating back to the 19th century, <clears throat> um, of cases that almost certainly were this disorder. The first uh, systematic description of the disorder did not take place until 1957, when a pathologist at St. George's Hospital, Donald Tear, described postmortems in a tragic family, multiple members of whom had died suddenly. And these members all shared in common the presence of abnormal thickening of the heart muscle. In fact, um, when I was a, a registrar at the Hammersmith, uh, I was privileged to look after members of this family, subsequent generation of this family, and sadly that attrition rate continued among this family. So after the pathological description in 1957, um, two groups, one John Goodwin at the Hammersmith and the other um, Eugene Brownwald, described the clinical features of this disorder. So there was an explosion of knowledge, 
But at that stage, the disorder was considered to be a very rare and on the basis of these sudden deaths, an extremely dangerous disorder. We now know that it's not. Actually, as a genetic disease, it's actually very common. If you screen whole populations, about one in 500 of the adult population have unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy, abnormal thickening of the heart. So a corollary of that is, given how common it is, it must be much more benign than we previously thought. So the original series reported annual mortalities of four, even five, six percent. Uh, we now know that actually overall it's much less dangerous, uh, that overall the annual mortality is a little less than one percent in an average series. So it's dangerous, but much less so than we thought. Nevertheless, for some families, this remains a malignant disease. And it is indeed, in most series, the most common cause of sudden death among young adults, adolescents, and especially among athletes. This is a paper from Barry Marin in the States from the 90s, which reported the causes of sudden death among US athletes who died suddenly. And you could see that the single most important cause, accounting for nearly 40% of all cases, was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So almost always there is a familial pattern of inheritance, uh, and this is a so-called autosomal dominant pattern. And for those who are not familiar with that, uh, for every gene we have a copy from our mother and a copy from our father. And dominant disorders are those in which you only need one rogue copy, one uh, abnormal copy of the gene in order to manifest the disease. So the affected individual carries this rogue copy and has a one in two chance of passing this disorder onto any one of their children. So that's the pattern. Now, in fact, it's not quite that simple because the penetrance can be a little reduced and the penetrance is age related. The disease is not present from birth. It develops at a stage later in life, anything from early childhood to late middle age. But what we do know is that of those in whom we identify the uh, genetic cause, 60% of these have been found to be due to mutations of genes encoding proteins in the sarcomere. And the sarcomere is the fundamental unit within both skeletal and cardiac muscle, which is responsible for muscle contraction and relaxation. So these proteins in particular, actin and myosin, actually um, uh, form cross bridges between each other. And this causes shortening a little like a ratchet, which is responsible for contraction of the heart. So this is the fundamental functional unit of muscle. And the first description of uh, the genetics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was in 1989, which was a family from the Hammersmith Hospital linked. Uh, the work was done in collaboration with the Brigham and Women's in Boston. And the mutation identified was found to be in a key protein of the sarcomere called beta myosin heavy chain. And this accounts for a substantial proportion of all cases that we've currently identified. The majority of mutations are private. In other words, they affect a particular family, and no family has exactly the same mutation, very commonly. And now the state we're up to is that mutations of 11 different genes uh, are responsible for this disease, and approximately 1,500 different mutations have been identified. This disease causes what's called missense mutations, or dominant negative. So what happens is the mutant gene codes and produces, codes for, and that results in production of an abnormal protein, a so-called poison peptide. And this abnormal protein interferes with this fundamental process of sarcomere protein cross-bridge cycling to interfere with that fundamental function of muscle. We made a modest contribution. So after the very first um, uh, gene identified in 1989, we identified uh, shortly after a large family in Queensland, Australia, who had only mild thickening of the heart, really nothing particularly impressive, but in whom the family had been decimated by cases of sudden death. And um, linked to work at the Brigham, uh, we showed that the gene responsible coded for a different sarcomere protein called troponin. And subsequent work has confirmed that this is a relatively important cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in general, families carrying mutations of this gene frequently show a relatively mild phenotype, a relatively mild hypertrophy, but often a very high rate of sudden death. 
So what about symptoms in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, about 40% of patients have no symptoms and indeed may go through their lives without ever having problems, or sadly, um, despite having no symptoms, may suddenly die at a young age without ever knowing they had the disease. But of those who have symptoms, a breathlessness and fatigue on exertion are common. Palpitations due to rhythm disturbances of the heart are common. Chest pains, which are often like angina, and occur because the heart muscle is greedy for oxygen. It's thick and it needs more oxygen than normal. So when patients exercise, they can't deliver enough oxygen to deliver its metabolic demands. And fainting attacks, or syncope as they're called, are also common in this disorder. So that's hypertrophic, and I'll come back to research in the area, but I thought it important to give you some context. And the other cardiomyopathy that I'm going to talk about is a condition called dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is a disorder in which the left ventricle and sometimes the right ventricle also are enlarged, they're dilated. And the contraction of the ventricle is markedly impaired. And again, this has to occur in order to call it dilated cardiomyopathy in the absence of another common reason, such as high blood pressure, valve disease, or coronary artery disease. And on the left is, again, our healthy subject with an MRI. And on the right, I hope you can see it's somewhat different. Um, so you can see that both the left and the right ventricle are markedly enlarged. And look what's happening to this left ventricle. The answer is not a lot. It's hardly contracting at all, hardly squeezing any blood out of the cavity into the aorta. And indeed, the other thing to note is because the ventricle is so dilated, it's stretching the ring of the mitral valve. So you can see every time the heart squeezes, it leaks blood back into the left atrium. So how do these patients present? Well, they may go through an asymptomatic phase where they have dysfunction of the heart, but they have no knowledge of the fact that there's a problem because they have no symptoms. But typically, they then at some stage develop symptoms, and most commonly, they get increasing exertional breathlessness or fatigue. Sometimes, this may occur very acutely, in which the lungs suddenly, in a matter of an hour or two, fill with fluid, and the poor patient is unable to breathe, has to sit up, and is very frightened, and this is a condition called acute pulmonary edema. Because the pressure within the uh, blood vessels, the veins, is raised, this causes an increased hydrostatic pressure, which causes leakage of fluid into the tissues. Oops, sorry, let me go back. And this is so-called edema, which you can see in the legs. The edema accumulates in the abdomen in severe cases, a phenomenon known as ascites. And this increased pressure also causes the liver, which is shown here in severe cases, to become markedly distended. So these are the features of heart failure. Some patients also experience sudden death, and this often occurs in the context of symptoms of heart failure, but sometimes occurs at a much earlier stage before the patient is symptomatic. And even today, despite huge advances in therapy over the last 30 years, heart failure, irrespective of the cause, remains an extremely serious disorder. This is a paper from 2001, but actually the findings, although prognosis has improved, so it has a bit for the other conditions as well, the message remains the same. These are data from Scotland, where there is tracking of all patients who are admitted to hospital. And what it shows is the mortality, or the survival actually, following admission to hospital with a number of common and very serious disorders, including breast cancer, myocardial infarction or heart attack, bowel cancer, ovarian cancer, heart failure, lung cancer in the case of women, heart attack, bladder cancer, prostate cancer, bowel cancer, heart failure, and lung cancer in men. And the message remains the same, that of these common and very serious disorders, the only one which has a worse outcome than heart failure is lung cancer. So it's a very serious and very common disorder of which dilated cardiomyopathy is an important cause, particularly in young people. So what are the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy? Well, we now know that probably around 50% are inherited. The vast majority of these show a familial dominant pattern of inheritance, but often profoundly age-related. Occasionally, patients have a recessive pattern. Some patients have a so-called X-linked, carried on the X chromosome. And uh, this is particularly true of muscular dystrophies, um, uh, conditions like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Becker's muscular dystrophy. And sadly, um, due to a phenomenon called lionization, often we see patients in whom 
a mother lost her teenage child of muscular dystrophy and then presents in middle age with severe heart failure. And she's affected by the cardiomyopathy having lost her son of the muscular dystrophy some years earlier. And the other disorders which can cause heart failure are disorders of the mitochondria. These, as we'll be describing later, are the organelles within the cell which produce energy. Because the heart requires vast amounts of energy, it's commonly affected in disorders of the mitochondria. And the mitochondria has its own DNA. Uh, and these disorders are characterized by a particular pattern in which both sexes can be affected, but only the mother can pass the disorder on to their offspring. Other important causes include alcohol, and this is a very common cause of cardiomyopathy in our society. And the drugs that we've used successfully to treat heart failure, uh, to treat uh, cancers, unfortunately have as one of the side effects um, a, a potential to damage the heart and cause heart failure. And this is particularly true of the drugs anthracyclines, but also Herceptin. And many patients with breast cancer are treated with a combination of these two, which is quite a potent mechanism for causing heart failure. Many patients with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy have an inflammatory disorder due to a, a viral infection, particularly parvovirus or adenovirus or Coxsackie. Sometimes it's a toxic factor and often it's due to autoimmune disease. So uh, an inflammatory disorder is common. Sustained fast heart rate can cause a reversible cardiomyopathy. And the other important one to be aware of is a condition called peripartum cardiomyopathy. This is a condition in which a, a young woman has a baby and sometime in the next few weeks develops severe heart failure. It's a condition associated with a very high mortality and only about a third make a complete recovery. And we now understand the mechanism. This is due to um, the um, hormone released to produce milk called prolactin, which becomes very high um, uh, around the time of delivery. And in the context of oxidative stress, um, an enzyme in the heart becomes activated called cathepsin, which cleaves this um, prolactin into a, a product, which then causes release of a particular microRNA, which causes the damage to the heart. And with prompt recognition of this cardiomyopathy, we now know that treatment with the drug promacryptine, which actually blocks the release of, of prolactin, can result in rapid and complete resolution of the heart failure. So an important one to be aware of. So almost half of cases of dilated cardiomyopathy are inherited. And um, unlike hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is almost entirely due to diseases of the sarcomere, diseases at, very, uh, at several points in the, in the cell can result in dilated cardiomyopathy. And this can include the extracellular matrix, can include the so-called cytoskeleton, can include the sarcomere, and can include the nuclear envelope. In addition, as we said, disorders of the mitochondria. So very heterogeneous. And again, we've made some contributions to this. So way back, we found a large family in Queensland and were the first to demonstrate the importance of mutations of a gene encoding a massive protein called titin, which is a protein that spans the entire sarcomere. And um, this protein acts as a molecular spring, which contributes to the contractile and also the relaxation function of the heart, but also has extremely important signaling roles. And we now know that of all the genetic causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, this is the most common. And we also reported a large family who turned out to have a mutation of this nuclear envelope protein, lamin AC. This family had a particular pattern which has proven to be true of subsequent families with this mutation, uh, in which they develop a, a disorder of the conduction of the heart, often requiring a pacemaker, about a decade before they develop heart failure. Uh, and with a very high rate of sudden death. Actually, it's the same gene, um, mutations of which are responsible for a type of muscular dystrophy called Emery Dreyfus. Um, but these patients had a very mild subclinical myopathy. So having given you some context about the diseases that I'm gonna talk about, I've chosen to talk about three themes which have occurred pretty much throughout my research career in relation to these heart muscle diseases. Uh, and again, essentially trying to illustrate the concept patient to, to bench and back to patient. So the first question I asked, and this was the very res first research I did as a research fellow, is why do people die suddenly with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and why do some of them faint? And we knew that about 50% of sudden deaths in this condition occur either during or soon after exercise. 
we knew that it was particularly common to occur in athletes. And we know that fainting attacks also frequently happen soon, during or soon after exercise, and that recurrent fainting in this condition was a risk factor for sudden cardiac death. So that was the context. So it was clear that um, exercise appeared to be bad in Hokum. Yet, of course, these were young people who commonly undertook exercise. And all of the um, guidelines at the time said that exercise testing was completely contraindicated in this disorder because it was so high risk. Yet they were all doing it in their everyday lives. So as a little light relief, um, but just to, to show you, clearly the paradigm at the time is don't exercise. So, the, as I mentioned, the guidelines had all said you mustn't exercise these people. Uh, but it seemed to me that's precisely why we should. If these people were running for buses, were exercising in their everyday life, and that's when they were dying, surely it was better to actually find out what happened in a controlled environment. I would say I think it's unlikely I'd have been allowed to do this today. Um, but that's to make a point. So we were interested in knowing what happened to the blood pressure of these patients on exercise. So we exercised a large, huge number of age match controls to define what a normal blood pressure response was on exercise. And we looked at 129 consecutive patients with HOCOM. And essentially, on the basis of the work in healthy controls, we defined an abnormal blood pressure response as either being a blood pressure at peak exercise less than rest, a failure to rise by at least 20 millimeters of mercury, or following an initial increase, then a significant fall. And on this basis, 35% of patients exhibited an abnormal response. And this was associated with younger age and with a family history of sudden cardiac death. We expanded this cohort to about 250, and we followed them, and we looked at what happened to them. And this is survival following the exercise test on the y-axis, starting obviously at 100%, over approximately six-year follow-up. And you can see that in the group in whom the blood pressure rose normally, 98% were alive. But of those in whom the blood pressure response was abnormal by six years, 30%, just over 30% had died. So this abnormal blood pressure response appeared to predict people who were going to die suddenly of this condition. So we're interested to know why. Why, why did this happen? Why did the blood pressure not rise? And we know that normally on exercise, in a healthy but untrained subject, young subject, cardiac output, the amount of blood the heart pumps, increases at least fourfold. And at the same time, because you've got to deliver oxygen to the muscles, there is intense vasodilation to the leg vessels. Leg blood flow increases more than 20-fold during severe exercise. But in order to balance this, there is a marked constriction to the vessels supplying non-exercising beds intestine, the case of leg exercise, the forearm, which balances this. So overall, the overall resistance in the circulation falls between two and two and a half fold. So that's the context. So again, I don't think we could have done this now, but we, uh, we actually addressed why this occurred. And theoretically, it could either be because you weren't increasing your cardiac output enough, 
or because the vascular resistance was falling too much, because there's a simple equation linking blood pressure, cardiac output, and vascular resistance, which is really analogous to Ohm's law, V equals IR. The blood pressure is equal to the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. So we looked at 14 patients with this disorder who had an abnormal response and 14 age-matched who had a normal response. And I placed a, a, a cannula into the brachial artery, the artery in the uh, elbow, and used that to measure each beat the pressure waveform and also to sample blood to take the oxygen saturation. And I placed a cannula below the clavicle into the subclavian vein and passed a catheter called a Swan-Gans catheter from the subclavian vein through the heart and out through the pulmonary valve and into the pulmonary artery in order to measure pressures, but also to take so-called mixed venous blood, the venous return that come from the rest of the body, again to measure oxygen saturations. And going back to our little slightly humorous um, uh, video, I then placed them on a treadmill and I, to add insult to injury, put a mask on them to measure their gases, their inspired oxygen, their expired carbon dioxide, in order to measure the oxygen consumption. Now, it turns out there's a neat little formula called the Fick equation, that if you know the hemoglobin, and if you know the oxygen consumption, and you know the saturation in the arterial blood, and in the mixed venous blood, you can calculate the cardiac output, okay? So every minute I did that, and this is what I found. So I'm taking two examples, but on the left-hand side, is a patient who had a normal response. And you can see that the systolic blood pressure, slightly vague, rises from about 110 to 160 millimeters of mercury, the diastolic a little less. If we look at the cardiac output, the cardiac output goes up from four to about 13 liters per minute. If we look at the resistance, the systemic resistance falls rapidly in the first two or three minutes and then plateaus, but overall it falls about twofold. So this is the normal response. On the right-hand side is a, 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 an admittedly relatively extreme example. And this was a chap who was 23 at the time who had no symptoms. And the first he was aware that there may have been a problem is when his 19-year-old sister, who had also been completely well, suddenly fell to the ground while running for a bus and died. And at post-mortem, she was found to have this condition. And so we screened the family and found that he was affected. So look what happens during these intra-arterial recordings. He runs along the treadmill, somewhat like the little polar bear. Um, and in fact, unlike the polar bear, he felt very well. But his blood pressure plummets from 110 down to 70, less than 70, at which point I uh, lost my nerve and stopped him. Um, he would have continued. He told me that in his everyday life, he would have continued to uh, run. So then we look at the cause, and in his case, the cardiac output rises from four to over 15 litres a minute, so more than the previous subject. It's nothing to do with the pumping action of the heart. The reason is that the resistance falls not twofold, but sevenfold on exercise. So this heart is pumping into massively dilated blood vessels, and the blood pressure plummets. Now, the sad postscript to this is that he shared his sister's fate, and two years later, he was just running modestly and dropped to the floor and died. So this is a very serious phenomenon. And if you look at the total group, you can see that the blood pressure at rest was similar between the two groups, but almost by definition, of course, the blood pressure at peak exercise was substantially lower in the group with the abnormal response. This is not to do with the cardiac output. The cardiac output at peak exercise was actually higher in the group with the abnormal response. They had a greater uh, cardiac output response the problem was the fall in systemic vascular resistance, which fell from 1,700 to 750 in the normal group, and from about the same figure to 428 in the group with the abnormal response. So this is a problem of abnormal vas vasodilation of the blood vessels. So we set about trying to understand why that may be. And I mentioned before that what happens on exercise is you massively dilate the blood vessels to the exercising vessels but you constrict vessels everywhere else. So the question was, was there something awry with that? Is it possible that you were failing to do that? So to do that, I exercised patients supine, lying flat with the arms outstretched and not exercising. And I measured blood flow using a technique called mercury and silastic strain gauge plethysmography. And this technique, essentially you measure the girth of the forearm and you inflate a cuff to above venous pressure, which means of course that the girth 
the girth of the forearm increases, uh, and it does so in proportion to the inflow of blood. So it's a way of measuring forearm blood flow. And on the left is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who had a normal response. And you would expect from what I tell you that the forearm blood flow would dramatically fall. And indeed it did. If you look at the slope of the increase in girth of the forearm, which is proportional to flow, here at rest and here on exercise, it gets much flatter. So these patients are constricting these vessels. This is a patient who had an abnormal response. And you can see that instead the slope is getting steeper. And across the entire group, the concordance between this abnormal response and an abnormal blood pressure response was extremely high. Uh, the chi squared produced a, a p-value of 3 naughts 1. So this appeared to be the mechanism. So I'll walk you through very slowly. But why does this all happen? So normally on exercise, why do we vasodilate our leg vessels? The answer is local metabolic products of, of metabolism, particularly adenosine, cause this direct vasodilation. And these same products, though, appear to activate chemosensitive receptors within skeletal muscle, known as metaporeceptors, which relay to the brainstem and actually promote an increase in sympathetic outflow from the brainstem, causing constriction. Even the thought of exercise has dramatic effects. It elicits the so-called flight and fight reaction, and this is the so-called central command reflex, which also, through the brainstem, promotes an increase in sympathetic outflow and constriction. But as our blood pressure rises during exercise, a, a counter reflex kicks in. The, the pressure receptors in our neck become activated, and stretch receptors in the ventricle become activated, which have the opposite effect. But in a healthy person, these two win, and therefore you get constriction. So it seemed to me that given that these patients have grossly abnormal myocardial architecture, that the most likely candidate was going to be a problem with the function of those stretch-sensitive receptors in the ventricle, um, related probably to abnormal wall stress. So how could we address this? And many years ago, we did this work. So we placed the subjects in a, in a, in a bed with a perspex half coffin around them, um, and they were sealed in from the abdomen downwards, and the perspex coffin, called a lower body negative pressure device, was connected to a vacuum cleaner which applied suction to the lower half of the body. And this process causes pooling of blood in the pelvic and leg veins and allows you to suddenly reduce venous return in a controlled fashion. And you can control that, and you can do that in a way that uh, reduces the venous return but has no significant effect on blood pressure. And there's a natural experiment. Um, uh, we know that what happens when you do that is that the foreign vessels constrict and we know that this is mediated through these receptors in the heart, and the reason we know that is because people who've had heart transplants who have no nerve supply to their heart completely fail to construct these vessels. So this is a cardiac reflex. It's nothing to do with the barrier reflex. So what happened in these patients? Well, the healthy subjects showed an increase in resistance, a constriction, much lesser effect in the patient with Hocum, and indeed, in nearly half of them, instead of constricting, the vessels vasodilated. And in fact, this pattern was associated with a history of recurrent fainting. So in summary, abnormal responses of blood pressure and exercise appear common, appear to be related to a high risk of sudden death, appear to be due to exaggerated vasodilation on exercise, and this appears to be due to dysfunction of stretch-sensitive receptors in the left ventricle. So we wanted to see whether the same mechanism was, was responsible for fainting. And we took 20 patients who had recurrent fainting and we fitted them with a device called a porta press which has a little finger cuff, plethysmographic cuff, which allows you every beat for 24 hours to monitor the pressure waveform of the blood pressure and to calculate also the amount of blood the heart was beating. And many of these patients had episodes of near fainting while this was on, and that allowed us to understand the physiology of this. So this is a typical example, and you can see the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure, and at this point, suddenly, the patient starts to feel faint, and the blood pressure falls from about 170 down to about 90 in the space of two or three seconds. And it takes about two minutes to recover, during which time the patient's feeling unwell. Key thing to notice, if that happened to you and I, our heart rate would increase, because the pressure receptors in the neck would become inactivated, and that would cause the heart rate to increase to try to compensate. Absolutely no response. Despite this drop in blood pressure, there is no reflex increase in heart rate. Indeed, 
the only time it happens is actually during recovery, not when the blood pressure is, is, is low. So if we look at all of those episodes of hypotension that occurred when this was on, on average, the blood pressure fell during these episodes from 123 to 80, with absolutely no change in heart rate. And again, the cause was not the cardiac output. Cardiac output didn't change. The fall was due to a profound vasodilation of the blood vessels, which was occurring often at rest, but sometimes on mild exercise. And the reason why the heart rate didn't increase is that we measured the gain of this baroreceptor reflex, the so-called baroreceptor sensitivity. And acutely, this reflex became impaired. And that's the reason why they weren't able to <coughs> develop a tachycardia. So on the basis of this schema, we, identified, we, we established a paradigm for sudden death, at least in some case of hokum. And we proposed that the combination, um, uh, that either exercise or postural stress or sometimes arrhythmia <coughs> would cause these receptors to suddenly inappropriately fire off. And we know from experimental studies that once this reaches a certain threshold, it causes a sudden surge in the chemical 5-hydroxytryptamine in the brainstem, which causes an abrupt withdrawal of sympathetic outflow and a fall in blood pressure. And if the patient is lucky, they faint and live to see another day. But if, like our 23-year-old, they have no symptoms, then they continue to exercise. The heart becomes ischemic, it becomes short of oxygen. And the combination of ischemia with altered neural tone and a totally disorganized heart, which is electrically unstable, results in a malignant rhythm disturbance that causes sudden death. Could we do anything about it? Well, given, at least in experimental models, the central role of a surge in 5-HT, we reasoned if we could do something about that, then we might be able to block this. And there's a commonly used group of drugs that are used in psychiatry to treat depression, called the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, an example being paroxetine. And these drugs prevent the reuptake of 5-HT into the presynaptic neuron, resulting in an increase in ambient 5-HT in the synaptic cleft. And as classic receptor pharmacology, that results in downregulation of the postsynaptic receptor. So we reasoned if we were to give paroxetine by downregulating the receptor, we would reduce the intensity of this abnormal vasodilation. So we undertook a randomized double-blind crossover placebo-controlled study, and we looked at two issues. We looked at the change in systolic blood pressure on exercise, and we looked at the vascular response to lower body negative pressure. And you can see that in the paroxetine phase, the increase in systolic blood pressure was substantially greater than in the placebo phase. And similarly, if we look at the placebo, during lower body negative pressure, these patients had a modest vasodilator response, grossly abnormal. It should constrict. But during paroxetine, this was converted into a mod modest constrictor response, and the difference was highly significant. So patient to bench, back to patient. So the next paradigm, which has occupied quite a lot of my research, uh, has been the concept of energy impairment in heart disease and its role as a, a, a potential for therapy. The heart beats, as we said, relentlessly and, cost, uh, and requires huge amounts of energy, particularly on exercise. Indeed, I think you will know that the energy is produced in the form of adenosine triphosphate. And that's cycled. It's produced, it's used, goes back to ADP. And every day of our life, the heart cycles six kilograms of ATP. It's vast, vast. That's how much it cycles. And it produces this energy by using substrates. In fetal life, that's lactate and glucose. But in adult life, it can use a variety of substrates. But typically, about 70% of it's generated from fatty acids because they're readily available. And we know that irrespective of which type of heart muscle disease, impairment of energetics is pretty much a, a hallmark of all heart muscle diseases. So this is some work by the Oxford group. And Actually, it turns out that using MRI, you can measure the energy status of the heart using a technique called phosphorus MRI, which I'll be showing you some of our data on. But essentially, when you do this, you place a voxel over an area of interest within the heart, and you end up with a spectrum of those um, molecules which have phosphorus within them. And this includes, sorry, I'll go back. This includes phosphocreatine, and it includes ATP. And I'll give you an analogy. So, the energy is produced by the mitochondria as ATP, 
but it has to then be delivered to where it's needed in the cell, in the cytosol. And that happens through the production of a, of a chemical called phosphocreatine. And this is both the transport form of energy and also it's a storage form of energy. And the analogy I want to give you is that most of us have a deposit account and a current account. So think of the ATP as the current account, okay? So if we're spending more than we earn, the only way we can keep ourselves in the black in the current account is to dip into our deposit account. Well, the same happens in the heart if you're short of energy. So the only way you can maintain a ready supply of energy is to shift the balance so the phosphocreatine is depleted in order to maintain the ATP. So a classic feature of energetic impairment is this ratio of phosphocreatine to ATP becomes depressed. And in this paper from 2003, they compared the ratio in healthy controls in patients with hokum, and you can see it was substantially reduced. And that was true irrespective of the genetic cause, looked at three different, three different genes, all of them had it. And really interestingly, even patients who carried the gene but had not yet developed the disease had energetic impairment. And we know from experimental work that the basis of this is that these poison peptides, by altering the cycling um, between these sarcomere proteins, waste energy. That's how this happens. So we were interested in two things. Um, was this energetic impairment just an epiphenomenon? Or actually, did it causally impair heart function and cause symptoms? And as a corollary of that, if you could correct it, would you improve the function of the heart and improve symptoms? And we know that the substrate you use profoundly influences the amount of oxygen required. And this is a paper, and I'm happy to take questions. In practice, the difference is much more than you would predict. So in this paper in a pig model, they looked at the relationship between the amount of work done and the amount of oxygen consumed by the heart to do it. And they looked at it under two situations, one with very high fat levels and one in which carbohydrates were being metabolized. And at any given amount of work, it costs 40% more oxygen to produce energy from fat than from carbohydrates. And again, to use an analogy, this is a, uh, a study in which two Land Rover defenders crossed Africa, one petrol and one diesel. And at each point along the uh, journey, uh, they plotted the fuel consumption on that part of the journey, with the petrol being the blue and the purple being uh, the diesel. And you can see that every point along the journey, the diesel consumed less fuel than the petrol. In the same way, carbohydrates consume less oxygen than fats. So the question is, by modifying substrate utilization towards carbohydrates and away from fats, would we improve energy generation, or would that improve heart function? And this is the mitochondrion. And for fats to get into the mitochondrion, they can't cross the mitochondrial membrane unless they have a carnitine group added to them. And this happens on the outer mitochondrial membrane by an enzyme called CPT1. The long-chain fatty acids then drop into the mitochondrial matrix and undergo oxidation through a process of beta-oxidation. And it turns out there are, is an old drug called perhexlene that used to be used to treat angina, which potently inhibits this enzyme CPT1, inhibiting fatty acid oxidation and forcing the heart to use carbohydrates. And another drug, trimetazidine, inhibits beta-oxidation. So there are two ways in which you can do this. So coming more recently, um, we undertook a randomized control trial of perhexlene versus placebo in patients who had severe symptoms and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we first of all wanted to test the hypothesis it would correct the energy impairment. So here is that phosphocreatine to ATP ratio. And this is the placebo group with a low ratio be both before and on therapy. And here is the perhexlene group with a substantial increase in that ratio during perhexlene therapy after about th uh, four months, four months of therapy, almost back towards normal levels. And we know that the problem with the heart pumping in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that the heart's stiff. And we were able to look at the, 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 the um, filling behavior of the heart using a technique called gated heart pulse scanning. This involves taking the patient's blood, labeling the red cells with a radioactive tracer called technetium, re-injecting it, and then scanning the heart. And from that, you get a so-called time activity curve, which looks at the changes in the volume of the heart over a cardiac cycle. 
and this is the ejection of the heart in which the volume is falling, and then this is the filling in which the volume is increasing. And from that time activity curve, you can calculate how long it takes to go from the end of ejection to the time at which the filling rate is at its maximum, and that's called the time to peak filling. And in you and I, dramatic changes occur in that on exercise. So although our heart rate more than doubles, we somehow manage to increase the filling of our heart on exercise so that our ventricular volume gets bigger and we squeeze more. And the reason we do that is that we intensely constrict the venules and small veins in our intestinal vasculature and also in our spleen, translocating huge amounts of blood from our abdomen into our heart to distend the heart. But that still wouldn't work, but for the fact that we actually increase the rate at which the heart relaxes. The heart relaxes much fa faster on exercise than it does at rest in normal people. So we were able to calculate this time to peak filling, and then obviously we had to normalize it to the shortened um, filling period, the RR interval, the time between two heartbeats. And in healthy subjects, even after you correct for this shortened period, there is a modest reduction in this so-called no normalized time to peak filling. But in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, instead of getting shorter, it got dramatically longer. Hugely abnormal response, in which instead of relaxation getting faster, it gets slower on exercise. And this is before and after placebo, which clearly made no difference. And here is the effect of perhexine. Here it is before, and here it is after, and it's almost normalized it. So it's corrected this profound dynamic abnormality. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the high adrenaline levels that occur during exercise stimulate our beta adrenal receptors, which activate uh, a, a, a signaling molecule called protein kinase A, which then phosphorylates lots of proteins. But key among these is a ion channel called CIRCA, sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. And this ion channel, at the end of contraction, suddenly sque uh, squeezes out all the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the cell to initiate the process of relaxation. And uh, when it's in its phosphorylated state, it does so much more rapidly. But secondly, troponin I, which is a sarcomere protein, when it's in its phosphorylated state, moves and actually forms, breaks the links between actin and myosin, actually causing the heart to relax. So activation of the sympathetic nervous system suddenly massively increases the rate of relaxation. So why does this go awry? It's not commonly known. It costs more energy to relax the heart than it does to contract it. Highly energy-dependent process. So if you're short of energy, particularly on exercise, this is going to go awry, and that's why it does. So this was all obviously very interesting, but did it matter to the patient? Um, and the answer is it did. So we looked at their exercise capacity measured by so-called peak oxygen consumption on the treadmill, and it was significantly increased, and that was associated with a substantial improvement in quality of life and other measures of uh, daily living. And for this particular form of cardiomyopathy, which is about 60% without obstruction, there was until that stage no evidence-based therapy for this condition. So on the basis of this work, the FDA in the US, the regulatory body, granted orphan drug status to this agent as the only evidence-based therapy for symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've shown the same in dilated cardiomyopathy. So if you look at the effect on exercise capacity, there was a significant increase. And if you looked at the pumping function of the heart, ejection fraction, which is a measure of how well the heart contracts, you and I are up here somewhere, these patients have terrible ejection fraction, significantly improved by perhexine. And much more recently, this year, we showed that it did, as we expected, dramatically improve energetics, the PCR to ATP ratio. But to our great surprise, we expected that to be associated with a shift, as we mentioned, from fat to carbohydrate. But we put a catheter in the coronary sinus, the vein that drains the heart, and another in the aorta. And we used that to measure substrate use. Absolutely no difference. So right answer, wrong reason. Um, it looks like it does work, but it doesn't work the way we think. So more to be done. Finally, I'm going to uh, talk about a contribution that we've made to our understanding of Starling's Law of the Heart. So all medical students know about Starling's Law. This is um, 
the relationship between the stretch of the heart and its subsequent force of contraction. And actually, it's more correctly called the Frank-Starling law, because the first work was undertaken by Otto Frank in Germany in the late 19th century. And then Starling extended that work in the early 20th century, working at UCL in London. And in this paper from 1914, uh, he used a canine heart-lung preparation, and he increased venous pressure, and he found the blood pressure increased when he increased venous pressure. And it did so because the heart pumped more. And he showed that the reason it pumped more is that the left ventricle got bigger. So increasing venous pressure distended the ventricle, made the heart beat more. Same on the right. And so we've come to understand the relationship between the degree of stretch of the heart and the subsequent force of contraction or the stroke volume, as shown here. Now, in Starling's original experiments, he showed that if you massively increase the pressure to a level way beyond anything you would ever see even in human disease states, you could eventually stretch the heart to the point where its force of contraction began to fall, so-called descending limb of the Starling curve. And this is commonly talked about in textbooks of cardiology. And we know that that certainly happens in skeletal muscle, the so-called length-tension relationship. You can stretch skeletal muscle to a point beyond which its force of contraction actually diminishes. But several groups, particularly cats and holobarsh, have shown that actually within the range of normal physiology and pathophysiology, it's not possible to stretch the cardiac sarcomere beyond the point where its force of contraction declines. So there appeared to be in real terms, no descending limb, yet all the textbooks of cardiology say there is. And the reason that I hope to explain to you is that in practice we don't measure stretch. We measure the diastolic pressure in the heart because we assume that the diastolic pressure is the distending pressure which is stretching the ventricle. And if we do that, we get a very different story. So this is quite an old paper. But in the days before effective diuretics, if a patient came into hospital with acute heart failure, lungs full of fluid, the only thing you could do for them was to take large amounts of blood from them to reduce their blood volume. So they venosected patients, took large amounts of blood. The other thing you could do is put rotating blood pressure cuffs to stop the blood getting back to the heart. And so they showed that when you did this, the atrial pressure dramatically fell. And as it did so, the cardiac output increased. That's a descending limb, okay, in anyone's book. So I'll try to explain this paradox through the work that we've undertaken. So the heart is surrounded by a pericardium, a thin membrane. And in health, that pressure is pretty close to zero. But in situations where the heart acutely becomes distended, the pericardium becomes stretched, and the pericardial pressure starts to raise, becomes raised. Now, in experimental models, this most ha commonly happens if you acutely raise the pressure in the pulmonary arteries, distending the right ventricle, stretching the pericardium, and resulting in a high pericardial pressure and a high right ventricular pressure. And when this happens, because the pressure is no longer zero, the, measure, the pressure you measure with the left ventricle, the diastolic pressure, is no longer the distending pressure, because actually the distending pressure is the gradient across the wall, not the pressure within the cavity. Okay? But we know that the pericardium is capable of growth, so everyone assumed that this was a phenomenon that just happened in acute experimental models. So many years ago, we undertook a study in patients with heart failure and in healthy controls. And again, we used gated heart pulse scanning to measure accurately the volume of the right and left ventricle. And again, we placed this Swan-Gans catheter into the heart in order to be able to measure the pressures in the heart and also to be able to measure the cardiac output. And we then put them in this lower body suction device again used it more than once, okay, to acutely reduce right ventricular volume by pooling blood in the legs. And in the healthy controls, as we switched on the lower body needed pressure, the pressures in the heart got less, and the right ventricle got smaller, and as you'd predict, the left ventricle got smaller, and it squeezed less, okay. In the heart failure patients, the pressures fell, the right ventricle got smaller, but in half of the cases, at a lower pressure, the ventricle got bigger, and it pumped more, okay? So this is quite a paradox. So why was this? So we did some work in an experimental model of heart failure, and we've essentially replicated this, but we were able to measure the pressure in the pericardium as well as the pressure in the heart. And so what we did was we 
um, occluded the inferior vena cava, and as you can see, the left ventricular diastolic pressure fell at the top here. But as the left ventricular diastolic pressure fell, so the amount of work the heart had to do, the left ventricular stroke work increased. So this is a descending limb of the Starling curve. So why was that? Well, the right ventricle got smaller as we inflated it, as we blocked the IVC, but the left ventricle got bigger just as it had done in our lower body and aortic pressure study. So why was that? Well, the answer is, as we dramatically shrunk the right ventricle and reduced the stretch of the pericardium, the pressure in the pericardium fell much more than the pressure in the left ventricle. So the result is that although the left ventricular pressure had fallen, the gradient across its wall had increased. So actually, the, the heart distended more despite a lower pressure, and therefore it squeezed more. So descending limb of the Starling curve is, is in the definition. Are you defining this in terms of the stretch or the pressure? If you're defining it in terms of stretch, there is not. If you're defining it in terms of pressure, there is. If that was complicated, I thought I'd give you a simple figure to illustrate the concept. So here is our poor left ventricle trying very hard to squeeze. And here is our big pressure and volume loaded right ventricle which is preventing it from filling and therefore squeezing. That's diastolic interaction, okay? So back to patient, can we do anything about this? So we reason that if the problem is pericardial stretch, it's all about the volume of the heart at end diastole. So if we could alter the timing of contraction and filling of the heart, so as to make the left heart contract and fill earlier than the right heart, that at the time of end diastole, which is what determines the force of contraction, total pericardial volume would be less, and therefore the constraint would be less. So in order to do this, we did studies in patients with heart failure in which we inserted into the left ventricle a very expensive high-fidelity catheter called a conductance catheter, which simultaneously measures both pressure and volume. And when you do this, you get, for each beat of the heart, and I won't walk you through it entirely, a, a plot throughout the cardiac cycle of pressure versus volume. But I want you to focus on two things, one of which is this point here, which represents the end of the filling period, so-called end diastole. This is the pressure at end diastole, and this is the volume. And that's, that stretch is what determines the subsequent force of contraction. And the other thing I want you to focus on is the area of the loop. This area is the total amount of work done by the heart during a cardiac cycle, so-called stroke work. So we then put another catheter in, and this was a balloon that we placed in the inferior vena cava to suddenly occlude the inferior vena cava and reduce right ventricular filling. And when you do that, you get a series of loops which move downwards with left ventricular volume falling as left ventricular diastolic pressure falls. But not in severe heart failure. So in patients with stable but severe heart failure, look at the same thing. This is that end diastolic position and this is before we inflate the balloon. This is after we inflate the balloon. So just as in our lower body and aortic pressure study, at a lower diastolic pressure, we've got a higher volume. Okay? The heart gets bigger despite a lower pressure. And if we look at the area of the loop, the area of the loop gets bigger because Starling's law tells us the more we stretch the heart, the more it squeezes. That's what's happening. So if we plot that beat by beat, you can see that for the first few beats as you block the inferior inner cava, the pressure falls, but the volume increases. And then finally, you turn the corner, and the volume starts to fall. And this is due to ventricular interaction. So we then looked at turning on the left ventricular pacemaker. And this is a single example. But you can see this pattern, as in the previous slide. As you inflate the balloon, the ventricle gets bigger, and its stroke volume increases. And then as you continue to block the inflow of blood, it starts to come down. And now we suddenly switch on the left ventricular pacemaker, and at the same pressure, the volume is much bigger, and it squeezes more. So we've got rid of that external constraint, and just to prove it, now when we inflate the balloon, it's normal. There is no rightward shift. So we've completely eliminated that external constraint. And across the series of patients, this technique either completely or partially abrogated this constraint, increasing stroke work. This is part of the mechanism by which cardiac resynchronization therapy and established treatment for heart failure works. But we know, coming back to our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because they have stiff hearts, many of them develop 
very high blood pressure in their lungs on exercise. So this is hot off the press stuff, not even published, um, only analysed a few days ago. And about half of these patients on exercise we showed, instead of their ventricle getting bigger, their ventricle gets smaller on exercise. And we undertook a randomised control trial of pacing versus sham pacing in a crossover fashion. And you can see that, lo and behold, during the pace state, it normalises it. The ventricle gets bigger on exercise instead of smaller because you've relieved this interaction. And did this matter to the patient? Yes, it did. The exercise capacity was significantly improved in these patients by improving the ability to fill the heart. And other hot off the press data, again not published, but work that we're continuing um, in Norwich, and this is the last slide. We looked at a group of patients who had a, a, a elderly people who have a condition called heart failure with normal ejection fraction. These are people who have symptoms of heart failure, apparently appear to have normal hearts, but their hearts are stiff. And they also get high blood pressure in their lungs on exercise, so we reason they might. And this is a so-called contrast ultrasound, and what we're looking at here is the left ventricle in cross-section, and this is the contrast in the cavity. And note that the septum here that divides the two ventricles is convex. And now we look on exercise, it's flat. The pressure and volume loaded um, right ventricle is squashing the left ventricle and preventing it from filling. And on this basis, we've just been funded by Medtronic to do a proof of concept study to look at where, whether left ventricular pacing would reverse this and whether that would result in improvement in exercise capacity. So in summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've shown you um, what cardiovascular physiology can tell you about underlying disease processes, how that can actually be applied to understand better ways to treat patients. And I wanted to thank um, the clinical PhD students I've uh, had as primary supervisor during my career, um, this group, and my current ones, Nick Gallup, Brody, uh, Sa uh, Satish, and also Crystal Lowry, who does uh, echoes and runs my lab. And to thank my mentors, and really to make the point, mentors are absolutely key to our research careers. And I've been blessed by having some very impressive ones, Mervyn Eady, Bill McKenna, Attilio Masri, and Gustav Bourne. Collaborators too numerous to mention, and funders, particularly BHF and MRC. But most of all, as you'll see from what's driven my research, patient to bench to bedside, my patients, without whom um, I certainly wouldn't have been inspired to do these things. Thank you.